Long live Texas. Welcome to Friend Gentlemen here on the 440 Sports Network and YouTube page. And you can follow me on Twitter at Braden Gall. That threw me off. It was not your normal. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the Aaron Dugan or Instagram Aaron underscore Dugan. I didn't realize how reliant I was on you. Uh, well, m- many you, you fall into the group of many. Uh, there's many people that just don't know how reliant they are on me. Um, Yikes. Mostly my two daughters. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> uh, Billy Lucci. Not relying on us whatsoever. Uh, Billy Lucci, of course, from Tex-Ags, the godfather of Texas A&M football, is going to give us a long State of the Union for the Ags as they head into one of the most critical seasons in Jimbo Fisher's career. Uh, and and I've got a, we've got some fun topics today on the show that revolve around the entire state of Texas. Uh, some athletic department revenue budgets came out this week. I thought we'd dive into that a little bit. So while we're talking A&M football, I figured, why not talk a little Texas football as well? They are a the preseason pick to win the Big 12 in, in the Athlon Sports preseason magazine on newsstands now. So I figured we could touch on Texas football versus Texas A&M football and see where they both are as they are heading into the same conference next year. It also creates a fascinating debate about who is the real UT when Texas gets into the SEC. Who is the real UT? I have a very, very strong case to make, Aaron, and I want to see if you can poke holes in my case. Okay. Or if it's like, if I've already convinced all 12 jurors that I'm right, you know what I mean? Like I need you to be the the defense attorney and try to poke holes in the case. I think that's kind of my specialty when it comes to you. So <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so I think let, let's get into first quickly. These, these again, Billy Lucci, Texas football, Texas A&M football, uh, who's the real UT. Uh, and, but I wanted to quickly rattle off some of these numbers that came out. I think USA Today published this on Tuesday this week. Um, the, the, the largest pub, this is just public. So it does not include Vanderbilt. Um, so the largest public athletic department revenue streams in terms of just total revenue for athletic departments in all of major D one college sports. Okay. Uh, number one, Ohio state, $251 million in revenue. Number two, number two, Texas, $239 million in revenue. Number three, Bama, $214 million. Number four, Michigan, 210. Number five, Georgia, 203. Those are the only five in America over 200. LSU at six, 199. Number seven, Texas A&M, 193. Number eight, Florida, 190. So we can pause there for a second and say, look, Texas A&M and Florida weren't all that great at football. So this is not necessarily tied to just being great at football. because No, it's not. A&M and Florida lost 13 times last year. At least, and and they finished seventh and eighth in athletic department revenue in in, in last season. So it's not tie, it's not tied to being elite. Other factors: historic, uh, historically good, lack of other things to do where the school is, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Wow, I didn't expect you to go that way. Well, uh, Gain- sorry. I thought Gainesville was a bustling, booming metropolis. Gainesville's fine. <laughs> uh, number nine, Penn State. Number ten, Oklahoma. One hundred and seventy-seven million. Auburn at number eleven. So that gives the SEC when they acquire Texas and Oklahoma. Starting, I guess it'll be what July first of next season. Mm-hmm. Uh, that will give the SEC eight of the eleven top eleven revenue generating athletic departments in all of college sports. Eight of the top eleven. So if Jeez. you have, if you, you know how we did a couple of weeks ago, we did an episode on like after the draft, like what else is next. You yes, know? it's like I guess it's it, now. Now they're going to completely dominate the revenue generating side of things just as athletic departments, not just football. Kentucky's at 16, Tennessee's at 18, wow. Arkansas's at 20. Kentucky Sa- before Tennessee, really? Yeah. Athlet- well, ba- the basketball. I can't Basketball's forget a big part yet, of that. Not just football. Um, uh, South Carolina, 27, Missouri, 28, Ole Miss, 30, and Mississippi State, 40. Just to give you a sense of the gap between Texas and Mississippi State, which would be number one and then number, I guess, 15 eventually. Uh, Texas made 239 million. Mississippi State made 110 million, and that's still a top 40 athletic department. So even within the top 40, there's huge gaps. A 30 million dollar difference. 130 million dollar difference. 130. Million. I thought you were a big quantum physics guy. Come on now. I missed something. Well, I'm a girl, but yeah. All right, listen, we don't we don't have genders on the pod. It's it's we are all we're fluid. We're fluid here on the show. We uh, are. And so I think. 
I, I guess it just it's not a long conversation here, Aaron, but it does call into like clarity to me that they're like USC is not in the top 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 twenty. UCLA is not in the top twenty. It calls into clarity that that even while USC and UCLA are great brands and good football programs, and they're gonna that's that was the counterattack from the Big Ten. Right. It just it just pales in comparison. Yeah, it, when you put it like that, I mean, you kind of just rattled it off. That wasn't much of a conversation, but it's okay. But well, I, I mean, gotta, I, I had to get all the data out there. I know, know and, and it didn't really have to be because it, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. When you see, we think about these like top tier schools, but when you break it down, like you just did with the difference between somewhere like Ohio State or just even any of those other schools that are at the very, very top and Mississippi State, who's still that supposed to be that high and you see $130 million in difference. I mean, I mean, we are, I guess, let me, let me stop it with a question, which is. Does this bring up the same concerns that you've always had about dispar- disparity and interest in the game as schools get further and further apart? I, I and you know, conferences I, as a whole. I think that's a really great question because I had not con- looking at this list. I had not considered, and Feinbaum said it on the show on our show a couple of weeks ago, where he's like, "Hey, I I think the future of college football is coalescing around big brands," which we have talked a lot about on this yep. show. And you're right, like. If Mississippi State is 40, do, do they make the cut? I think this number really is a a, a really big positive for Kentucky. Like if, if Kentucky mm-hmm. was sort of a team that's on the fringe of being a big enough brand to to make that top 40 breakaway in the future of college football, well, to say that they're the 16th most profitable athletic department is pretty impressive. Uh, but I think that's a great question. I mean, Mississippi, if I'm Mississippi State at 110 million South Carolina 142 million Missouri 141 million Ole Miss 133 million I mean you take away Lane Kiffin or Shane Beamer and obviously now Mike Leach is gone like what are these programs what are these athletic departments in the grand scheme of football if there's a breakaway I think it's a great I don't know I don't have an answer for you on that I don't either food for thought it's too freaking terrifying is what it is uh, I don't want I don't want the egg bowl to not be a part of college football at the highest level. It sucked. That would suck. Um, we have other, to believe it's not going to end there, but you know it it raises questions. Here's another one that's really interesting, though. Okay, Virginia at 14, and I think North Carolina is at like 21. 161 million for Virginia. Indiana was number 13. So the point is, is that when we talk about expansion into the East Coast, and we talk about Virginia and North Carolina as brands and as big schools and athletic departments and sort of being the state brand, there's a big argument right there. Virginia is one of the highest grossing ACC athletic departments. They're not, so, good, at it. They're not good at much of anything. <laughs> that's do- that's old money donor, right? I Maybe. Yeah. It's gotta be. I'm telling you like what I, I really think that that's what it is about Virginia. That's it, that old money been there for forever. I mean, Virginia is like one of the closest things to Ivy League that's not actually Ivy League. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. They're alumni. I mean, when I remember going through the college application process and I was like, uh, you know, trying to get like a scholarship to Virginia, they have all of these huge full ride scholarships that are fully funded by alumni who just decided to do it on their own. And we'll just take on one and hand pick the this- the student and like give them a full. So it just, it just told me about that's a different kind of money that I hadn't seen anywhere else. It's like one of the only things I remember about like money wise during the college application process of being like, that's weird. No other school does that, but I just think they have so, so many donors. Just interesting. I wonder if that's really what it well, is or so something I'm, else. I, I, you, you went, you ended up, first of all, humble brag there about uh, for, for trying to get a scholarship from Virginia. Uh, well, I didn't, get, I didn't get it. So, well, you went to Vanderbilt, like actually the Harvard of the South. Right. So, I think what's interesting is, and I I think you have an interesting perspective to offer on that from Vanderbilt, because Vanderbilt has long had huge, deep pocketed money donors that don't give money to football, or or yeah. or, or athletics, let's say. Yeah. It's, and so I think that's the question: is we're all those. There's a lot of those people at Virginia, like Vanderbilt, because they care deeply about their Virginia way and their Virginia a- academics, and that rightly so, they've earned it. Yeah. But but this is de- a- athletic department revenue. So and I and I actually have a lot of family in, in Charlottesville and I have like my cousin is a huge Virginia fan. My uncle was a professor there. My you know, my two of my cousins went there. I've got a lot of deep ties to Charlottesville and they are extremely proud of their university, but they are not like their basketball program is really, really good. Right. Uh, they've got a really good baseball program. They've got really good lacrosse and, and other sort of Olympic sports. But like their football program is not necessarily 
right all that all that special so to see them at i'm number, gonna find out exactly what it is i at number 14 in all of that's i mean that's crazy that's, that's nuts but it also speaks to why the sec and the big 10 want virginia and north carolina because mm-hmm. they they are not just big brands in the states and the new recruiting footprint and etc cetera, etc cetera. It, it is they are money makers and there's no tv network there yet that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, just food for thought for people to kind of chew on a little bit. Stop throwing shit, Braden. Sorry. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Billy Lucci's going to give us a Texas A&M State of the Union. We're going to talk a little Texas football here. But I thought we would start with, and we'll compare and contrast the two teams because they are in very different places, but both have lots of optimism heading into the season, but with very diff- for like very different reasons. So it's going to be, we'll kind of debate that a little bit. But mm-hmm. I thought I thought we had I think we need to have this discussion and I'm going to make the case and I want to see what you think about it. Okay. Who is the real UT when Texas joins the SEC next year? Who is the real UT? Now, I am I would like to think I'm uniquely qualified to make this case, your honor. I, I think a... Go, Go ahead. ahead. Well, so I lived in Dallas for 3 years. I lived in Austin for 3 years before moving to Tennessee. I went to the University of Tennessee. My brother went to the University of Texas. So we have this discussion in our household. And mm-hmm. when you go to when you go to grade school in the state of Texas, as all of you listening know, you get a lot of Texas history in your like curriculum. Uh, I don't know what the curriculum is anymore with the current governor, but that's neither here nor there. Um <laughs> the U so here's a couple 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 of facts here as to why I think Tennessee is the real UT. Now Texas Really? Is- Texas is a bigger, more powerful athletic department, as we just laid out, right? Number two in all of revenue, $239 million. Tennessee down is at number 18. But here's, here's my case. And again, I'm just going to lay it out, and you decide what you think. Okay. A couple of factoids here as to why Tennessee is the real UT. 1794. 1794 is when the University of Tennessee was, was created, was founded. The university. So the University of Tennessee was founded 1794, okay? Okay. Texas did not become a state in this country until 1845, 50 years later. It's a strong start. (laughs) (laughs) The the prosecution rests, Your Honor. (laughs) Um, Then the University of Texas was founded 40 years later, in 1883 so the university of tennessee 1794 texas was annexed by the united states december 29th 1845 you're gonna get a history lesson today on the show Mm -hmm. so so university university of tennessee 50 years later texas becomes a state and then 40 years later university of texas becomes a thing so tennessee as a university is 100 years older as the university of texas just want to point that out that's my first my first point your honor point number two For those of us who did grow up in grade school in the state of Texas, you learn a lot about the Texas Revolution, the Alamo, Santa Ana, the the revolution breaking away from Mexico to become the Republic of Texas, which happened in 1836. They were a republic for about 10 years before the United States annexed them into the Union. They were also a a non-slave state, for the record, which was a big part of the problem of them joining the United States. (laughs) Because right around 18... It ran around 1845. What happened a few years later after that? (laughs) Yeah, we all see it. So it became, it had to become a slave state. There was lots of politics involved in that, shockingly, in the state of Texas. Yeah. Who, who, Aaron Dugan, who Uh went down to the Alamo and died, according to Steve Spurrier? Pee Wee Herman. (laughs) Jesus Christ. No, okay. Who went down to the Alamo and died famously in the Battle of the Alamo to try oh, to shit. win to try to win the independence for the state of Texas? They were called volunteers, and his name uh, was Davy freaking Crockett. And he went down there from the state of Tennessee and went and died in the Alamo to help Texas win its independence. So not only was Tennessee a hundred years older than Texas, but the but people from Tennessee went and helped Texas become a state and died for it. Old, this... old, old William Travis and Jim Bowie were in charge, but number three in charge at the Alamo, Davy freaking Crockett, a Tennessee human being. I will say it's it's your argument is faring better when you're going back 
<laughs> several hundred years. <laughs> Like, I do think this argument is easier in the context that you're putting it than it would be, you know, the last 50 or so. No, but this is the right approach. I mean, you're doing it correctly. Right? I have no further questions, but you can keep going. <laughs> I just think, like, Texas is a bigger, more powerful brand. They are in a bigger state with more football depth and talent. Like, they've won a national championship more recently. I'm not arguing the size and scope and power of the athletic department. Texas is bigger and more powerful. There's no question. Mm -hmm. But who is the real and original UT? I don't think you can make an argument that it's Texas. I don't think you can make an argument. You cannot it's make an. You definitely can't make an argument that it's the original. That is that you have you have done it. <laughs> you have you did it. <laughs> I feel like I had a pretty good case. Bra Braden basically said, you're welcome, Texas, and stamped it and was walked away. Um, well, again, this is the conversation I've had with my brother because <laughs> he well, went to he... Texas and I went to Tennessee. I've, so I've been you've prepared. had a long time I'm... to build this. <laughs> I've been prepared for this one. There are I pulled up a bunch of like all time stats about um, a little bit more recent than what you just said. But um, that's, fair. that's fair. There are a lot. There is some, you know, big discrepancies in. You know, I think in certain categories, like, but honestly, overall, like I was expecting a larger difference in like all time record and like a bigger discrepancy between those two. I mean, the national championships, Texas has been uh, to four and they're 16th, you know, over of 131. Tennessee has been to six uh all-time record i mean honestly they're, they're just not as far away historically as i thought they were yep. and i'm not sure um i mean like 357 nfl draft picks for texas that's 14th um 360 for tennessee it's 12th so there's a lot of stats that are a lot closer than i you know expected I, 58 bowl games for texas 55 for tennessee look at a you. 40 Six first round NFL first round NFL draft picks, 47 for Tennessee. They're like kind of neck and neck in a lot of ways that I didn't realize. Te I think I think a lot of that speaks to that Tennessee is a far more established and bigger program than people realize. Texas, I still would argue, is the better football program long term. Um, which I think is again Are you saying that because of potential and like ceiling and no support? like support? No, Texas more national, recruiting pool. more national more national championship. Yeah, I just think the state of Texas is deeper, deeper. It's it's got a richer history of college football than Tennessee the state of Tennessee does. Um, there's a lot to love about Tennessee's. I think that, to your point, most people don't realize again, Texas fourth all time in wins, eight hundred and eighty five, Tennessee tenth all time in wins. I don't think people would assume that Tennessee is tenth all time in winning uh in college football history. Uh, they both did technically start in the exact same season of football, 1902. So if, you, if you're talking about the university, UT, I think the argument's clearly Tennessee. If you're saying what's the better football program overall, I think you probably have to lean Texas. And I think that is the strongest argument that Texas people will make, is that, no, we're, we're the real UT because we're the better football program. But they're not as far, to your point, they're not as far apart as people think. Mm -mm. Nope. I was, I mean, I, I mean, I know a lot about Tennessee because I'm I'm from here. So I think maybe I understand, you know, their history and their strength as a program better than some people would. So I think people can overlook it a little bit, but it was, it was closer even than I thought. Yeah. And I, and again, I am, I lived in Austin. I grew up going to Texas games. I watched priest Holmes and Ricky Williams in the same backfield before moving to Tennessee and then going to the university of Tennessee. So I like, I like both of them a lot as just a, an individual, like a, like in my heart, you know, like I have ties to both of them. I, again, my brother went there. So like, right. I just, it's, I, I do think if you had to say who's the better football program, Texas is the answer. I think mm -hmm. uh, historically and, and it's not the better team in 2023 necessarily. Although I think Texas is ranked ahead of Tennessee in the preseason rankings. It's not about like which, which year, which team has been better. Tennessee and Texas have both been very dysfunctional the last 15 years. But right. they went to they went to two national championships in 05 and 09. Tennessee mm -hmm. hasn't been Tennessee hasn't been close to that since 98. So right. or, or or maybe even 01 if you want to say they they were one game away in 01. So it's Texas has been better in the last 20 years. They've been better in the last 100 years. But if you want to talk about university being established, Tennessee's 100 years older and Texas wasn't even a state when people from Tennessee went down there and fought and died to make sure you could become a state, Texas. Just want to let you guys know. I feel like Again, I feel you're like it's a pretty good argument. <laughs> yeah, it's it was strong. I I didn't I didn't expect this from you today, 
day, but I'm awake and ready to pay attention <laughs> in class now. So <laughs> this is a classroom and a courtroom all together on a college football podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that brings us to the Texas football program, which we're going to get to A&M and we can kind of compare and contrast the two because I think they enter the season in very strange optimistic, but sort of different ways. And we'll let Billy Lucci do a lot of the talking on Texas A&M. I want to get your thoughts on them, Aaron, in just a second. But um, Texas comes in as the better football team right now. They they are the preseason favorite to win the Big 12. They are number 11 in our preseason rankings. A&M is number 20. Right now, Texas, in our magazine, has the number one quarterback in the Big 12, the number one running backs in the Big 12, the number one wide receivers and tight ends in the Big 12, the number one offensive line in the Big 12, the number one defensive line in the Big 12, the number one linebacking core in the Big 12, and the number one set of defensive backs in the Big 12. One of the best offensive coaches in the country, and Steve Sarkeesian. Mm -hmm. They've got some questions on defense, but they are third in the nation in returning production, 85% uh, on offense, 68, yep. 68th in the nation in returning production. Texas A&M also returns a ton of production. But Texas's quarterback is a little bit more experienced. The offensive staff is a little bit, in my opinion, I'd rather have Sarkeesian over Fisher and Petrino. Uh, Texas is super, super interesting and super dangerous right now. And they are trending in the right direction to enter the league next year. They are. Sorry, there's a bug in here. I was trying to catch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the So, yeah, I mean, everything you just said, you just went over literally everything. But... Uh, the the transformation of Texas, I think, is one of the most impressive parts of where their roster was versus where it is now. Um, it's pretty insane. Like the I think we've seen some quicker turnarounds in these bigger programs and even, you know, than than even we're used to. I mean, we've seen some impressive turnarounds. We talk, I mean, again, I feel like we talk about this somehow every week, but just when you have talent like LSU normally has, you have to put it back together. That's one thing. Texas really had to totally transform their roster from two years ago to now. They went from not having the O-line that you would need to ever compete yep. um, against this caliber of teams, even if you're not in the SEC. Um, and that had a serious glow up. Um, and then also receiving wise both wide receivers and tight ends we've seen you know uh, there's there's a ton of talent there um Xavier Worthy Jordan Whittington's not hurt anymore all of those guys that are really going to be able to make a dent put points on the board and not only you know and and play that fast paced game be able to score fast answer quickly and hopefully you know give the you know give the defense a little bit of wiggle room to to make mistakes if they can produce that quickly put points up I, I think and and Athlon does this where we have um anonymous scouting reports in the magazine. It's like our favorite part. I know it was one of your favorite parts. It's my favorite part. Uh, it, it's one of the more interesting parts of the magazine. And I asked Billy Lucci about this later, so you'll hear his response. But one of the quotes about Texas A and M was, "This is a roster where everyone talks about name, image, and likeness is a bad thing. They have a culture issue, and it shows on the sidelines and games. Ultimately, they're always going to have guys on the roster you die to have on yours." But can they ever make it click and go to Atlanta? Petrino will either Petrino will either push them over the top or blow them up. That's the quote about A and M. I ask Lucci about it later, so just hold 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 for a second because here's the quote about Texas, which has always had too many cooks in the kitchen. It's why it is so big and powerful and rich, but not able to sort of win the championships, right? As much as mm -hmm. they maybe should, like Bama, let's say. Right. Here's the, here's the quote. This staff has really, really changed that culture. Bo Davis and those guys didn't screw around, and they've been weeding out the typical Texas entitlement that we're all used to seeing. Mm. Those boys can hit now. They could actually back it all up this season. We shall see. Those are both, wow. from, those are both from opposing coaches anonymously within the Big 12 about Texas and within the SEC about A&M. And Aaron, those are wildly different scouting reports about culture in those two spots. And if if you have not already learned on this show or elsewhere culture in and of itself is wildly underrated as it um as it used as a metric for teams and and how they click and what they can actually do um maybe not game to game but over the course of the season so that is i mean get the getting rid of the typical texas entitlement is mm. i mean that hits yes it does um so i, I mean wh what do you think like is this a team that can score like 40 points a game 
I, I think so. I wrote down like the top questions I have for each team. Okay. And and number one on for Texas A&M was with a bullet as coaching staff. And Billy's going to talk about this. Like, can they all sustain success together? We've talked ad nauseum about this. Like, they're going to burn hot. They're going to burn fast. They're going to be good. But how long can they sustain it? Because it could all blow up in their face, right? Like, it's right. very vo- it's very volatile. Um, but Lucci's going to talk to you about it. He, he says there's some people inside the program that say things are very different this year. So, again, I'll let him explain. But but number one for Texas is Quinn Ewers to me. Right. Is, yeah. Does Quinn Ewers take that step? Is he the Quinn Ewers that lost to TCU where he wasn't very good? Or is he the Quinn Ewers in the first half of the Bama game where you where he could not miss anybody down the field and had them in a place to really potentially beat Alabama last year at home? He gets hurt and then the game is a different game after that. So I mean, I do you th- really think that I will say that as good as Quinn Ewers is. I don't necessarily, I mean, you've got Malik Murphy and Archie Manny just sitting there waiting. So I don't think it would, could, I mean, yes, it would definitely take a big toll on the season, but it's not like the entire ship is going to sink. I mean, yeah, it would Ar- struggle, Arch, but it Ar- wouldn't it's sink. Arch, it's Arch Manning, Aaron, Arch. Sorry, sorry. It's just habit. But I don't know. I mean, yes, it, he's a huge part of it. And again, I think just what they have, what they're going to be able to do in the air um if he can connect with his you know if with his receivers and and tight ends and then you know they grabbed um who they get from Georgia Adani Mitchell oh yeah i think so i think that's the name so yeah i mean the, the roster is good and if, if they can connect i mean i think it's going to be a very it seems like it's going to be a fast paced team that can get things done quickly um but yeah you're right we have to see a certain Quinn Ewers and yeah. not the other one <laughs> for the state for both of these programs and this is partly why I wanted to do this episode kind of together today, because SEC fans need to start caring about Texas if it's truly changed the culture. Because I think that the, there's never been a problem with players for either of these two teams ever, like in the history of their programs. It has yeah. never been about talent. It's never been the problem. The problem is like the volatility, the lack of alignment, the culture, the coaches that sort of aren't doing all the dirty work in the in the trenches each day. And like, if Texas truly has changed, and if A and M truly has changed, I think they're both top twenty teams. Like, yeah. they're both really good football teams. I think Texas is slightly better because their schedule is easier because they're in the Big Twelve. But yep. I mean, like, they play at Alabama. I mean, like, they're they're playing a new schedule too this year because they have to play BYU at home, and they have to play at Houston in conference play because, of course, the Big Twelve is changing this year as well. So, like, they've got a strange schedule. They do. And then A&M, of course, has New Mexico, Miami, UL Monroe before they go Auburn, Arkansas, Bama. They're only road games, Texas A&M, this year. I thought it was interesting. They're at Tennessee, which my daughters are making their new one stadium debut at, which is guaranteed, hey. guaranteed to lose, of course. <laughs> got, got to teach them how to be Vols fans somehow. Yep. Um, at, at Tennessee, at Ole Miss, and at LSU. Those are the – like, they play at Miami week two, but they will play almost every game at home or on a neutral field other than Tennessee, Ole Miss, and LSU, which are, granted, very good football teams. So, yes. I, I don't know. It's I not think... an easy SEC road schedule, but it's no. it's not a lot. Not when you also have Auburn, Bama, South Carolina, Mississippi State at home, Arkansas, the neutral field, and then at Miami. It's a tough schedule for AM. I'm not arguing oh, that. Oh, yeah, no, not discounting strength of schedule. It's just, you know, the neutral site games, I don't know. They, here's the stat, and this is the Bill Connolly nerd number of returning production, and this is why I'm really optimistic if the culture has, in fact, been changed by both programs. Okay. Texas is seventh in the... Texas A&M is seventh in the nation in overall team returning production. 80% of their production returns on both sides of the ball. Yeah. Texas is 19th in the nation, both of which are at the top, near the top of their conference. So they are... A&M is only one of eight teams to return their entire... All five starters on the O line. Yes, exactly. Um, Texas is uh, Texas and LSU are two other ones, I think, actually. But here's the other thing, and I think this is the slight difference here. And we'll we'll we can end this conversation here because I think Texas is the favorite to win the Big Twelve. A and M's I go, I think is going to b- bounce back. I think this is the difference. All those five stars for A and M, they're they're sophomores and some juniors. Texas has projected seven senior starters on defense and three junior starters. That's 10 of their 11 starting defensive players are going to be upperclassmen. That is a great stat. If you are hoping for a big step forward from Texas, a great so. stat for this year. 
Yeah, and then bad for next year. Welcome yeah. to the SEC. <laughs> yeah. Welcome yeah, to the exactly. SEC, Santa Anna. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I just I just wanted to do a little quick like here's how good Texas could be this year. Here's how right. good A&M could be this year. And we're not, not. going to do it better than Lucci, so we probably don't have to right. dwell on it. Right. And it's not it, and it's not about the players. It's not about the players. It's about yeah, the coaches it's, and the culture. It's a, it's LSU vibes. If you can get it together, you can do it. Maybe they can get uh, old Davy Crockett to transfer down to Texas A and M and do that. Do some work for them. Maybe who knows? We shall see. Um, in ten ninety nine basis. <laughs> I like that. I like that. All right. So uh, here was our conversation with the great Tex from Texags, the great Billy Lucci. Billy, welcome to the show, man. How are you, sir? Good, Braden. How you doing, brother? I'm I'm doing great, man. Talking season right around the corner. Uh, maybe it never ends these days. Uh, so let's. I want to start with. Uh, Twitter season, not always talking. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, your your guy down there was the the king of talking season last year. It's been a little quieter this year. So, I guess my first question to you is: What do fans need to know about how the staff is working together now that practice, spring practice is over, and we are heading into media days here in in less than a month? About what what do fans need to know about the coaching staff and how it's all coming together? I, everything's been great, but you know. I know with the next comment, you know, from people that you say that to is, well, what's it going to be when it's third and six and a and ms up seven against – it's third and four and a and ms up seven against Auburn in the fourth quarter at home and Petrino wants to take a shot down the field and Jimbo wants to – you know, who wins that? I don't know the answer to that. And I, I don't think anyone really knows, and that is, I think, one of the legit questions – is is that a Jimbo decision? Is that a Petrino decision? Is that a work together decision? And people seem to file that one, th throw that one out. Like that's not possible. Even the Petrino call in the play is not possible. I disagree with that. I, I I don't know the answer, but to to dismiss those possibilities, I think it means you don't really know what's gone on across the street in that building. Things have gone really well. I think Jimbo has embraced it. Um. Players have come in here and sat at this desk and told me, man, it's a lot different out at practice. You know, Jimbo is taking more of a 30,000 foot view of practice, coaching every position, kind of watching everything. He'll still tell the quarterbacks about footwork and, you know, you know, arm angle and release point and things like that. But Bobby Petrino's coaching quarterbacks and yeah. he's exactly what you think of when you think of the term offensive coordinator. We, I don't we, think AM's had that. Yeah. We, we use evolution as a term all the time for coaches. Like we're talking about it right now with Dabo Sweeney, um, Nick Saban famously when he hires Kiffin and evolves yeah. the offense. Uh, outside of just the Petrino thing, which I know gets all the coverage, like has Jimbo changed at all from day one in College Station to where he is today? Like how can you compare and contrast those two Jimbo Fishers? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, I've, uh, Kendrick Rogers is hosting a podcast with me. He of the, uh, you know, monster LSU seven overtime performance, one of the best, you know, ever by an AM player, I think. And he's out at practice and stuff. He's noticed it. And he's a guy that played for Jimbo the first two years in college station. And he, you know, I've had some older guys come in and say, yeah, he reminds me more of year one Jimbo in college station here in year five in terms of just his demeanor and his, I think he's enjoying this right now, Braden. I really do. Now, again, there's nothing enjoyable about five and seven in, in year six. There's nothing enjoyable about seven and five or even eight and four. We, we understand that. But I think all you have to go on is right now and what you've seen since this staff has changed. The one thing he said, everybody wanted him to sit up there and just go, hey, our offense stinks this year. It's my fault. I can't do this anymore. I can't do the OC and be the CEO and monitor everything in the program and handle in the world of transfer portal and NIL. And I, I, I just can't do it anymore. They wanted him to say that for some reason, everyone in the media wanted him to just raise his hand and go, this thing's not working and it's my fault. That's what the media wanted to hear him say. Not only Jimbo Fisher, but most coaches don't say that he did say, he did say, Yes, giving up the play calling is something I would consider and look into because things, you know, we're, we're always looking at you. He kind of said that early on. No one believed him. 
he said at the end of the year they would look at all things. He didn't want to say, I'm going to fire my OC or hire a new OC with five weeks to go in the season and then walk back upstairs into a staff meeting. They wanted him to say that. He wouldn't say it. He basically said it, though. He said many times over, the role of the head coach has changed so much in the last couple of years. It's changed so rapidly. It's something that certainly I need to look at. He was saying those things, but he just didn't say it in the way that everyone wanted him to. Yeah. And his actions have, have followed that. And I think his actions, when you watch practice, you, you see a different Jimbo Fisher. And will that result in wins and stuff? I think a lot of that depends on this O-line. It depends on probably a young quarterback in Connor Wigman or an SEC veteran in Max, whoever, you know, runs this offense the best. I, I think Connor, you know, has upside through the roof. And I think a lot of it depends on what we talked about, that dynamic with Petrino. But they're pretty excited quietly over here. And you mentioned it earlier. It's been quieter. I don't think that's a bad thing based on the no, last couple of years. No, I, I would agree with you. Um, I you mentioned the quarterback. I think that's where I was going to go next is, is Connor Wigman. Did you see enough? Cause like, honestly, when you think about the best team that Jimbo Fisher had in college station, I think you could tie it directly to two things. He got the most efficient quarterback play out of Kellen Mond and the best offensive line play all in 2020. And people forget that they finished one spot out of the playoff. Obviously yeah. very strange year. I get it, whatever, yeah. but not the point. The point is everybody else was playing by the same rules too. And they finished fifth. The best way anyone said it, by the way, <laughs> it, there is it is worth saying that right it's not worth leaning into that and saying well that's the only reason they had a you know so yeah i i you, what no, you it, said you, exactly you, right his best team was when they had the most efficient quarterback play in the best offensive line shocking yeah. that's sort of a thing that happens in football yeah um did you see enough out of connor for him to be the guy and to give them that level of efficiency and productivity and where that you know you got four guys coming back on the offensive line a lot of depth a lot of talent where 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 are those two positions at relative to the 2020 team that did have the most success? And really, they've got five coming back on the O-line because Bryce Foster, when you look at returning starters, you might not count him because he, start, he, he, he missed the first couple, then he played a few. Uh, that's when the offense started to look good, and then he, and then he tore his ACL. He's at, but he's back. He'll be back for fall camp. He'll be gone. So really, they return the five starters they'd want to return. You also return three guys in backup roles that started last year at times. So finally the depth, the experience, uh, Adazio's got to figure out how to make them into a, you know, a well-functioning unit, but man, they should, I, I, to me, Braden, I'm at the point, there's no excuse for them not to up front. Efficiency is an interesting word that you use because I think in th that 2020 offense and how Kellen performed, I look at it and I go, man, Max Johnson could really do that. Uh, that, is, that is exactly what he can do. He can run some. People really sleep on his running. He's a, very steady, and he can hit some, you know, when the throws are there, he makes them. Uh, really not that dissimilar to Kellen and what he can do. So, but you saw Connor Wigman against Ole Miss. That really kind of a record-setting first start for a true freshman in the SEC. There's some interesting numbers out of that game if you go and dig into it in terms of total yards and touchdown to interception, QB rating, things like that. And then the way he played in that LSU game. You know, Devon A. Chain ran for 228. That's the storyline, the Moose Muhammad catches. But if you go watch that game live and in, 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 in real time, I'm pretty sure Connor didn't turn the ball over. He had a couple TDs. But you watch him on, on a third and seven or something towards the red zone, scramble for the sticks and outrun Harold Perkins. You watch some of the throws he made early in that game in rhythm and on time. You watch him like say, hey, I'm going to throw it up to my receiver and let him catch it in one-on-one. -on -one. There were some things he did in that game that you go, okay, that's a, that's a future star. And I don't think people around the SEC – are mentioning him enough in terms of that potential. So it'll, it'll be interesting if he, he'll have to win the job in a, in a first year OC and a guy that started a year and a half in the SEC and beat Arkansas and Miami for AM last year when, when the Aggies were coming off a loss to App State. 
Yep. What Max did last year was impressive. I think Connor has the potential to have one of those seasons where I don't even know if efficient is the word. It might become, can he be efficient enough to go with all the spectacular he can do? And it's a very similar decision to what Cliff Kingsbury and Kevin Sumlin had on their hands when it was Jameel Showers and a red shirt named Johnny Manziel. The difference is Connor Wigman started four games. Yeah. I know the Auburn game went badly. That was without Moose or A-Chain. It's a bad day, all, bad night all the way around for everyone over there at, at Jordan Hare. But you look at how he played in two of his three SEC starts, it's a little different than even – and I'm not saying he's Johnny, but it's a little different than Johnny who – you had never seen play down a college football it's, prior to that. It's, it's it's keeping it right here on like second and ten in the second quarter, right? Like yeah. you gotta you gotta keep it right here. Um, I'm gonna go to the other side. I mean, offense gets all the the run and and just for a million reasons. But defensively, you look at this depth chart, you see a lot of those four and five star kids starting to pop up in the starting eleven, especially mm -hmm. in the in the twenty two. Uh, this was not a good team stopping the run last year. They got to increase their pass well, rush as well. Bad at times. So is I, like to me, I see the talent, I see the stars, I know the coaches are there. DJ Durkin's got a pretty sound scheme. As volatile as the, all these coaches are, they're very good. So mm -hmm. the the question on defense is: Have they fixed some of those issues? Is linebacker the concern? What what's the state of the front seven, in your opinion? I think linebacker's a concern. I think Adrian Cooper's good. Can he be great? Maybe he could. Maybe he has all SEC potential. I don't think you enter the season thinking you have. A, you know, he hasn't played at an all-SEC level game here or there where he really flashes. But I think Edrin's a good senior linebacker with a chance to get a lot better this year. Um, I love his ceiling. I know a lot of NFL scouts do as well. Outside of that, there are some questions. They went in the portal and got a productive linebacker out of Jackson State. Chris, Rush, Chris Russell flashed at times. Uh, Martrell Harris flashed, flashed at times as a true freshman. And they've got a couple promising true freshmen, but a linebacker is a concern. Like, can you get that level of play? But there are guys that, that Durkin likes to stand up. Eni White was a borderline five star recruit a year ago that was hurt some last year, but when he played, he, he showed a lot and he could maybe stand up, you know. So there's a couple of instances like that, but I think linebacker is a question mark and uh, depth at corner is a question mark. You know, they went and got a second team all conference corner. Second team all former second team all ACC pick out of Boston College. They got a former five star recruit and three year starter at Carolina and Tony or yeah three year starter in Tony Grimes out of Carolina. But and Tyreek Chappelle's back. Outside though of those, I, I think there's a real depth concern at corner that they're going to have to figure out in camp. But man, you could put a lot of talent, Braden. On that starting defense, you could put a lot, and they got guys like Cooper thought about the NFL and came back. McKinley Jackson came back, which is a big one because he has been a dominant. Go watch that Alabama game last year, his first game back from injury. They missed him so badly in those first five games, and he came back against Alabama and was pretty dominant. He's back. Damani Richardson gives them a fifth-year guy at safety. You've got a ton of talent up front that they're no longer true freshmen. And you also got arguably the best D lineman in the country coming in in DJ Hicks. But you, you know, really, you got two five stars incoming in DJ Hicks and Gabe Brownlow Dindy, who essentially red shirted last year after a, a torn ACL prior to his freshman year. So the rich get richer. That D line should be so much better. Shamar Stewart, Shamar Turner, Walter Nolan. I'm naming five stars here. I mentioned Eni White, Malik Silla. You barely saw last year. He made noise against LSU at the end. Um, these guys, LT Overton, who started as a as a true freshman at 17 years old last year um, and, and was a five-star. So all those guys back in the secondary, I mentioned a few of them, but Bryce Anderson and Jacoby Matthews who are, are both you know really exciting young guys. Jordan Gilbert at safety played a lot last year. So – they could field a hell of a, a hell of a defense when you look one to eleven, and really go a lot deeper than that on the D line and at safety. My concerns are depth, and will they be, you know, can they find the difference makers at corner and linebacker? 
particularly linebacker. But yeah, Durkin's got a lot to work with. And I would contend, you know, there's no Jabril Peppers back there. Um, I would contend there's no reason he shouldn't have more to work with talent wise than at any stop in his career. Maybe maybe when he was at Florida under those some of those Will Muschamp defenses, but that that would probably be about the only thing to compare. Well, and, and the, the best way to help uh, weakness at linebacker and at corner is to have an elite defensive line taking up blockers and pressuring the quarterback into throwing the ball early. So uh, that that is a good way to look at it. Um, eight and four. So we, Athlon Sports, we have Texas A&M at number 20 in the preseason. I believe that's fifth in the SEC total uh, behind three teams that are in the top six. And then yeah. I think they're kind of close with Tennessee and, and Ole Miss and Kentucky and Arkansas. They're kind of all in that mix. Really healthy middle class. Yes. You just named three of the four probably biggest games for them this year. Yeah, right? and it's and it's all I, I think it's an extremely healthy middle class in the mm-hmm. SEC, stronger than I've ever seen from like three through thirteen. It's all really really yeah. close. But we at Athlon have A and M at twenty in the nation, fifth in the SEC, eight and four. If that happens, what is the reaction to the from the fans? I mean, I don't think anyone's going to be fired up and celebrating and I think people are going to be disappointed. I, I think that's fair what you said. I mean, I, I, I think if you put the over under at eight, five, I'd struggle with it myself. And, and I think nine is being, that's on the optimistic side, you know, like, I don't think optimistic, I think nine is, but you look at that schedule and you mentioned that middle class, guess who else you could throw into that middle class, you know, that A&M plays South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Mississippi State with Will Rogers. Um, you, you know, Auburn. Ole Miss. Auburn, you know they're going to be better with freeze. I think a and some people say, well, it's a good thing you catch them early with all that transition. I think it's probably a worse time to catch them because I think as the season goes on, the reality is the talent, yeah. And so I think catching them early in September is a, a tough ask. It, I'm, I'm, you're fortunate you're getting them at home even though that's been a road team series of like, or really since a and joined for 11 years or whatever. You know who else is of that level? You can take Miami, throw them in there too. They're kind of, if they were in the SEC, they'd be yep. in that exact group you're talking about along with A&M. So there are so many toss-up games that you go, man, there's just no way to tell where South Carolina, A&M, Ole Miss, Auburn, Miami, of all those teams, Texas A&M had better be one of the two best. And I'm leaving out LSU and, and Bama. Look, I think there's a chance they could get Bama if they're if A&M's good enough. Like if A&M, everything we said, not not the, the perfect storm, but if A&M gets good online play, Wigman's that dude, Petrino gets to be Petrino, and that defense takes a big – you know, second year step. I'm not saying be a top 10 defense. I'm right, saying be a right. top, top 20 defense. If those things happen, that's a tough, tough game for Alabama considering what all they're looking to replace. So, yeah, I mean, you can see where this team could get to nine and maybe go win a bowl game and win 10. And I think that would be the, that would be the number where everybody goes, okay, we're back. And I don't mean back like a Sam Ellinger, Texas, we're back. I don't mean back like back <laughs> – to say and put us up there with Georgia and Bama. I'm saying back on track under Jimbo and say, look, we had a young QB. We had a first year OC and, and we made, we, yeah, we got yeah. back on track towards having a chance to build this. And I know people would say, Hey, it's year six. And you, what do you have to show for it? And you'd say, well, I mean, a top five finish and you know, uh, that people will say one ten win season, I would say two when you win ninety percent of your games and you so happen to play ten. That that's something that like yeah. these yeah. jackasses on Twitter want to use a talking point, and then some jackasses in the media don't have the common sense to to not take the troll bait from a rival fan base, so they take it and use. It would be to me two ten win seasons. Is that what you're paying for? No, but I do think yeah. if you went from five wins and not a bowl game to a ten and three type of thing be pretty pretty damn good especially with what you have coming back for 24. Yeah, you're not what we thought we'd be talking about 6 yeah. years in but you I'm we're grading and evaluating year 6 
not not the tenure per se. No, you're getting paid to get to Atlanta. That that you don't have to be on the same level as Georgia, but you're getting paid to get to Atlanta. I'm now. I want you to know, and Texas A&M fans, I want you all to know. I am doing my, me and my wife are doing our part, taking our daughters to their first game at Neyland Stadium uh, this year for fall break. Okay. Lines up lines up with Nashville Metro schedule. He's kind of jinx it in favor of A&M. Oh no, we, there's no chance Tennessee's going to win the game because I'm taking that my daughters. With you. Wow, <laughs> because I'm taking my daughters to see yeah. ten, Tennessee play. And it, guaranteed victory for for texas a &M. guaranteed victory is what that well, means Braden, i appreciate it you've done that for us <laughs> once with that That's state true. bet over the south carolina game so hopefully your streak your your streak continues so there's a quote in our magazine from an opposing coach again take it for uh, what it's worth it's from an opposing coach and it basically says uh they have a culture issue it shows on the sidelines ultimately they're always going to have guys you want on your roster you wish you have but they can never make it click and get to Atlanta. If it doesn't click mm -hmm. and they don't get to that nine or 10 wins and again, cause they've got all the pieces you mentioned. What is the reason if they stay back at where, where they were last year, they don't show any progress. What, what is the reason that you would des describe as why that would happen? Like why, why would that happen? Well, my first thing, and I saw that quote because people, you know, like I'm, I, look, I think there's a yeah there's a culture problem when you go five and seven and you lose a bunch of close games and you have guys you know like you I saw it on the sideline I mean like go watch a losing sideline where a team goes from preseason top 10 to five and seven and find me a sideline it wasn't like there were fights going on and look we saw what happened on TV with the sleeves and, and Jimbo and Moose in that game like it's real easy to say that and and I don't disagree and and little things and i don't want to spend all day going into it but just little things like i talk to people that tell me when things are bad that's the one common misconception of me because people just see me on this on twitter and i'm, I'm like going to go to bat and defend against people that i just think you know are popping off and if i have a few minutes i'll go spar with them for fun but they don't understand that we sit here and talk about this and when i do go talk to sources or whatever i wouldn't be worth a damn if i only talked to sources that pump sunshine i've been doing this for actually 25 years now and i have my people that tell me it's bad and this guy is a bad teammate or this guy's a great teammate or this guy this coach is doing nothing you know i i i get all of it and to a man people even the you know the negative side of the glass half empty types that i talk to are like it's noticeably different the energy at practice the attitude of the kids what they're required to do in terms of just little things like coming to workouts with the shirts tucked in and everyone wearing the exact same thing and i don't know when it got away from that but it did and to jimbo and that staff's credit they they recognized an issue and they've brought it back and i think a lot of the guys that left um I think the kids that stayed, particularly in that recruiting class, where so many of them stayed, which no one talks about, I think they said, this is us. This is our team. Like the guys that left, let them go. And the culture and attitude is improved. I don't disagree with what that guy said, the coach, but I also think, yeah, go watch a sideline that goes five and seven when they thought they were going to go to the playoff or whatever they thought in that locker room and show me a good sideline energy and show me a bunch of happy campers, coaches and players alike. So if it doesn't work, Braden, do I think it's necessarily culture? No, I think it would be more their performance on the field. I think it would be, if it didn't work, I think a lot of it would have to do with two things. I think the O-line would underperform again, which would be a real problem uh, for not only Steve Adazio, but for, you know, Jimbo, right. the whole thing, the whole thing, right? O lines to me the single biggest key because they have a chance to be good. But if they're not good, and you have a young QB and a new, yep. o, like it's a problem. And you have such skill talent. So I think if it didn't work, it would be because of the O line and because of the defense. If Durkin lives in a three man front too much again and they can't stop the run, you mentioned that. If those two things go down, I think that's why it doesn't work. I don't. I think the culture and, and the desire to win and just having the guys in and kind of what they've been doing this summer, yep. it looks, feels, and sounds different and, and, and in a good way. So I think if it doesn't work, it's because they, they fail 
at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Well, they got lots of dudes at both those positions, so we shall see. Billy, always a pleasure, my man. Thank you so much for giving us some time. We do appreciate it. And we'll see you right, in buddy. Nashville and in Knoxville this year, baby. Absolutely, buddy. See you, Braden. Thanks. All right, man. There you have it, our Lone Star edition of the pod. A little history lesson there, a little UT arguments, some revenue distribution, and uh, Texas versus Texas A&M. I, just, I, I sure as hell hope we get a nine-game schedule so we get that game every freaking year because if we don't, oh, damn. it would be an absolute travesty. It would. Travis, Travis Shamakery, even. You're a better teacher than I. people give you credit for. Thank you. Which and is, I, I've never heard anyone talk about, well... They, you are, tell, you, you're a good teacher in certain aspects. I've just never heard you teach history. <laughs> I, I'm and, sort, of a, sort of a weird nerd for it. And and frankly, Texas doesn't give you a choice. When you go to grade school in Texas, it's U.S. history one year, Texas history the next. World history the is next year. Is that for real? Yeah. It, so I went to six years That's of grade school. That's not real. Six years of grade school in Texas. I had three years of Texas history, one year of world history, one year of American history. It like alternates. Every other year, you're going back to Texas history, and you're going to learn a new layer about Texas history. That would explain everybody from Texas. <laughs> uh, it does, well, they were their own country. They were their own country for like 10 years. And well, so, yeah, I get it. But it's it was a while ago. But yeah, no, that's know. great. I mean, it obviously you obviously know your stuff. So <laughs> they, they did what they wanted to do. Yes. Like the way people the way people know, like presidents names around the country. I know all of them is the way Texas people know, like William Travis and Jim Bowie's names. Like yeah. that, that they know those names, James Bowie and William Travis, Lake Travis High School, Lake Travis. It's all named after him. <laughs> so yep. uh, there you go. All right. Thanks for hanging out for us. Of course, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. You can get to Aaron at the Aaron Dugan on Twitter. They're Aaron underscore Dugan on Instagram. You can get to me at Braden Gall at 440 Sports. Please check out the YouTube page, rate, review, subscribe, all that great stuff. We do appreciate you guys. We'll talk to you next week. This has been Fringe Element here on the 440 Sports Network. Long live Texas.